Welcome to the Food Junkies Podcast. Here, we aim to provide you with the experience, strength, and hope of professionals actively working on the front lines in the field of food addiction. The purpose of our show is to educate you, the listener, and increase overall awareness about food addiction as a disease with abstinence as the solution. Here, we talk about all things recovery. Most importantly, how to thrive rather than just survive. So stay positive, make a change for yourself, tell others about your change, and hopefully the message will spread. Hey there, Food Junkie listeners. As promised with season two, we're bringing you more resources for recovery. And today is no different. Darlene Lancer is a licensed marriage and family therapist specializing in relationships, narcissism, and codependency. In her private clinical practice, she has treated individuals and couples for over 30 years and coaches internationally. She's a sought after speaker at national conferences, in media, and to professional groups and institutions. Darlene's articles have been published widely in professional and popular periodicals. You can see her eBooks, 10 Steps to Self-Esteem, The Ultimate Guide to Stop Self-Criticism, How to Speak Your Mind, Become Assertive and Set Limits, Dealing with a Narcissist, Eight Steps to Raise Self-Esteem and Set Limits with Difficult People, I'm Not Perfect, I'm Only Human, How to Beat Perfectionism, Spiritual Transformation in the 12 Steps, Codependency Recovery Daily Reflections, and Freedom from Guilt and Shame, Finding Self-Forgiveness. Blogs and more information about her seminars and coaching packages are available on her website, whatiscodependency.com, where you can get a free report, 14 tips for letting go. You can follow Darlene on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and on Twitter. Find her also on YouTube, SoundCloud, and Clip. Be sure to check the show notes for links to all of the ways you can follow Darlene. In today's episode, Clarissa and I speak with Darlene about her personal and professional journeys. What is shame? How and why shame is counterproductive? how shame manifests, whether or not there are gender differences in experiencing shame, parental relationships and shame, coping skills required to be resilient to shame, what signs and symptoms to look for, how to start your healing journey, future projects, and our signature question with a twist. Welcome, Darlene. All right. Thank you so much for being here today with us. Darlene, can you share with us your story of why you became interested in focusing your career on helping people understand and recover from shame and codependency? Like, let's just jump right in there. So I'm glad you asked that question because my recovery from codependency started long before I knew it. I was in a 12-step program of Al-Anon because I was married to an alcoholic. And back in the day, nobody talked about codependency. In fact, Melody Beatty's first book, on the subject hadn't been published, or I think it had been recently published, but it wasn't widely known at that time. And it was discouraged to even talk about psychological jargon at those meetings. No one talked about trauma, PTSD, violence, intimacy, abandonment, those kinds of words. But gradually, I was making progress in changing and overcoming my codependency, uh, not knowing that. And then I changed careers from being a lawyer to a therapist. And I was doing that work with my clients, again, not naming it as codependency, but helping them to individuate and be more autonomous. And then I wrote a blog about, are you codependent? And Wiley Publications saw that and had decided to write a dummies book on codependency. And they reached out to me and I had to compete with some other authors and therapists and they handed me the job. I went, I, they asked me, I thought, oh my goodness, that's what I've been doing for years. It's like, I know all about that personally and professionally. And it was like, perfect. I just had never really named it and claimed it. So that's started there. And then after that book came out, Hazelton contacted me and said, we loved your book. Would you write a book for us on shame? We read your blog. I had done another blog on shame is the core of addiction. And so we worked together and that book came out. And that really enhanced and accelerated my work with clients because I was able to really zero in on what's not frequently talked about. It's the elephant in the room. Yeah, exactly. I I think... 
for any, most of us who have struggled with addiction, you know, shame is something that we live with every day due to our past behaviors. So can you explain to our listeners, what is shame and what are the insidious ways shame undermines us? Okay. Well, shame is an emotion. A lot of times I write about self-esteem because people don't identify with shame. It's not commonly talked about in the U.S. Children are more raised and socialized with guilt in Western countries than shame, like in collectivist cultures in Latin America and Asia, Russia. They publicly shame their children and the government shames them. And so it's very common to think about shame, but it's just as prevalent in the U.S. It's just more referred to as guilt. And shame will cause guilt, irrational guilt, and it will cause low self-esteem and it will cause fear and it causes eating disorders and aggression. And it's not helpful to shame someone, even in the criminal system. Shaming is counterproductive. It makes people withdraw. Guilt is actually, it was surprising for me to learn, I did a lot of research for the book, that guilt actually promotes reformation because you're encouraged to reach out, make amends, change your behavior, and it's that you did something wrong, whereas shame is you are wrong. You are the problem. So people feel irredeemable and they withdraw, and then they continue to shame themselves and box themselves in. Whereas guilt, I think, oh, okay, I I just changed my habits. I can make amends. I can change my behavior. And that's one of the blessings of the 12-step programs because the steps include a process to basically face your flaws, your mistakes, your defects of character, and then, quote-unquote, confess it to somebody, which is included in all religions, and then make amends to either directly to the person and changing your behavior and it's the whole message is that you're redeemable. You know, you can change versus, so it converts shame that people have into guilt so that then they can improve themselves. However, my own experience was that often it doesn't, the 12 step problems don't go deep enough. So I actually thought my self-esteem was pretty good after completing all the steps. And I was teaching about self-esteem. And then I had a dream one night that I had to get to know this woman named Shame that I didn't want to know. So I dug deeper and because it was unconscious. So there's shame manifests in different ways. And sometimes it overtakes a whole personality. And we've all seen people who you can spot if they have very little self-worth. They may, their posture may be rounded. They sit in the back of the room. They don't talk to anyone. They withdraw. They don't say much. And most people are not drawn to them. They feel like they get the message that the person is withdrawing and that's a boundary. And so they don't get close to them because they're withdrawing because they don't want to get close to people because of their shame. But then there's other people, including narcissists, who think that they're great and a lot of caretaking, controlling codependents who feel like other people have problems and they don't. They may not be aware that they have shame underneath. So they feel good about themselves and they don't maybe too often experience, consciously experience shame, or they do sporadically, but they don't name it. They don't realize what it is, or sometimes it'll break through with some events where they're exposed publicly, and then it can be devastating to them because they haven't dealt with it before, comes as a shock. Sometimes that's what will send like a narcissist into uh, when his defenses aren't working or her defenses uh, send them into a depression they might seek help so you asked how it manifests and how it hurts us so yeah that's i mean i think that covered you know everything that i can think of when i work with clients with the disease of addiction you know and we think about codependency and shame and i think you're right and kind of how you were wrapping up the answer with the narcissistic individual, you know, kind of brings me into my next question. In your books, you mentioned that women experience more shame than men. And I was wondering if you would elaborate on that 
you know, I, I was wondering too, like, does this have anything to do with parental relationships? You know, I myself personally have a parent that I believe was, you know, narcissistic personality disordered. And many of my clients have similar kind of relationships, you know, so does that all, how does that all tie in so that women experience more shame than men? What is that about? And does it tie into that parental relationship? Well, shame in in general is instilled in us by dysfunctional parenting. So that's a whole topic in itself. But in terms of gender differences, it's true that I say that in my book. And I was referencing a statement in in another source a number of years ago when I wrote that. But there is other research that questions that assumption. And the assumption, apparently, people are now saying, is based on the type of questions that the researchers ask. And often they have questions about events that are particularly situations that would be particularly shaming to a woman. So if you hurt someone's feeling, if you jeopardize the relationship, all re- a lot of relational types of questions about what people think of you and how you behave and how that impacts the relationship and how it impacts how others see you. And this is very important to women because women are socialized to connect and relationships are very important. So if the questions were more balanced and asked about how you feel about crying, you know, people seeing you cry or not feeling strong or being unemployed, those things are more gender specific to males. So they're questioning that. And then they also think that another theory is how children are socialized. So men and boys are encouraged to be more autonomous and independent and not show their feelings. So they have a lot of shame when they feel weak, they can't handle something. But for a girl, that's not necessarily shameful. She will seek consolation with a parent, with a girlfriend, you talk about it, and she's more comfortable with her feelings. So that's just one example. So it's still, I think, When they take a just for other factors, including guilt, because boys tend to feel more guilt and girls tend to feel more shame. And they take out the guilt factor. Sometimes the statistics come out evenly. So I think the research is in conclusion. And my own experience, of course, it's a very narrow segment of the population, a really handful, is that men and women experience it equally. It just may be about different topics. So women are very conscious of their appearance or how they are as a mother. And some men are very concerned about their parenting, but more about how they provide for the family, how strong they are, how physically potent they are, things like that. So, but I wanted to get to your earlier question about Clarissa, about how shame manifests. I really didn't get a chance to answer that. So Some of these manifestations are symptoms of codependency because shame really underlies most of the symptoms. So it can lead to people pleasing because you want people to like you. Codependents have the belief that if they're loved, they're lovable. The underlying belief is they're not lovable or they're not worthy. They're lacking in some some way. So they have to do more. So that's another symptom like overdoing doing more than your share of work in the office or in the relationship. Like you feel you, you're not enough. You have to keep giving and trying and, and helping more than other people. And it can lead to control because if what the other person thinks is ultimately going to give you a sense of well-being or esteem, you have this other esteem instead of self-esteem, so it impairs your self-esteem which is a symptom of codependency, then you try to control the other person. So you don't want them to be angry. You might manipulate them to give them gifts so they'll like you. And again, pleasing behavior or accommodating what they want. You'll disown your own needs. And in my book, I talk about shamed feelings and shamed needs and aspects of it. These are shame bonds. So if you reached out to a parent for consolation or affection, and you were rebuffed in some way, even if you were overtly shamed, but your parent was preoccupied, or you're a big boy now, you don't need that, or go talk to your father about it, or, you know, 
some way where you're rebuffed or the parent is uncomfortable with their own feelings, then you might start feeling, if this happens enough times, you start feeling shame about asking for your needs, asking for support, asking for love. So that's a shame bond. So what happens is that children start to repress those needs because it's bad enough to have them, but then to be turned away when you want something, then it feels humiliating. It's shaming. So better not to feel it at all, right? So I'm not going to even experience that need because I know I can't have it and it would be too painful to ask for it. So then it goes underground. So then you're in a relationship and you're not even aware of your emotional needs. You don't ask for them and you might not even miss them. You just think, but then you're unhappy or you're resentful and you don't even really know why or know what you're missing. And if that's the way you grew up also, you don't know a different way. Like I had a narcissistic mother and she wasn't good at nurturing. She wasn't empathetic. She wasn't consoling. And I used to wish that she baked cookies like other mothers. I didn't know what I was missing, but I saw those other mothers were, you know, involved with the brownies or the PTA and they were baking cookies. So I thought I wanted that kind of mother. So then later in my marriage, I didn't know that that was missing either. So I, you know, after more recovery, I realized that I needed some more. I was doing all the caretaking and giving and nurturing and supporting. And somehow indirectly, I thought maybe I'll get it back. But uh, that was what I was doing. I was modeling what I needed, but I wasn't getting it. So those are some examples. And then feelings can be shame. So I wasn't, I was punished for getting, expressing anger. Like, how dare you talk back or, go, you know, go to your room. And so I would disown my own anger. So feelings get shamed. And then you just breed resentment and your anger is a healthy emotion. It tells you you need to take action. Maybe you need to set a boundary. And then it leads to insecurity because you don't feel worthy. It leads to indecision. You don't trust yourself. And then if you can't be open and honest because you're afraid of losing a relationship, well, first, you don't maybe know your feelings and your needs, so you can't ask for them and you can't express them. The communication becomes very dysfunctional. So there's this whole spiral that stems from shame. So your communication is dysfunctional. You feel the boundaries are skewed. So you feel responsible for your partner's feelings instead of your own. And there's a lot of arguments that go unresolved. And as I said, you have to control the other person or you want to take care of them, then you feel needed and because you don't feel worthy of being loved, so you settle for being needed. So you might be in a relationship with someone very needy. And then it can lead to perfectionism because if I'm, I have to be perfect because the reverse is I'm unworthy, I'm a failure, it's black and white thinking. And then all this leads to depression because you're disconnected from yourself. That's the main thing is like, it leads to a disconnection from your real self because it's totally veiled in this a shell of shame. And you show the world just a, a fragment of who you like, a persona that's manufactured. So you'll be liked. So you'll be nice. And then you hide your anger and you hide your feelings of shame and your vulnerability. And so intimacy is compromised because you can't be authentic because you're not in touch with yourself. And you're afraid to be vulnerable because if you show who you are, you'll be rejected. So a narcissist is an extreme example of that because they have a lot of disdain for being vulnerable because there's so much shame underneath. And then you keep pushing yourself to uh, achieve maybe because you keep trying to win the approval of your parents, even maybe long after they've died or to prove other people's validation. So you push yourself to do more and achieve and maybe end up in an abusive relationship because you can't set boundaries. You don't feel worthy of love and care. And it could also lead to procrastination because you're risk avoidant. You don't want to look foolish. You don't want to make mistakes. You're afraid of being judged. So your world becomes smaller maybe not as small as the person who sits in the back of the room and is their whole life is consumed by shame. But even people that are more public, you know, will stay in a role or limit. It maybe it comes out in personal relationships. So I think I covered a lot of the symptoms. 
You absolutely did. That was great. Thanks so much, Darlene. Can you tell us a little bit about like what coping skills are required to be resilient in the face of shame? Well, some people are more in touch with their feelings than others. So if someone's introspective, if they're aware of their feelings, that can be very helpful. Some people have so much trauma in their childhood that they just really need a lot of support. They're overwhelmed by their feelings or anxiety. It's hard for them to take the steps that they can. For instance, there are specific things you can do to build your self-esteem and to become more assertive. Those are the two eBooks I first wrote, 10 Steps to Self-Esteem, The Ultimate Guide to Stop Self-Criticism, and How to Speak Your Mind, Become Assertive, and Set Limits. So both of those, raising your self-esteem and becoming more assertive are definitely things that people can do to combat shame and start to feel better about themselves. But some people are not able to do that. They just feel it's too depressed or too anxious. And so they need more support till, till they can get to that place to start following through with a plan, or doing homework, or taking action. So if someone is more proactive in their life, more introspective, they will be able to go to a 12-step program. If they're not too ashamed to reach out for help, those are things that will expedite and accelerate healing because many people are too ashamed to go to therapy because, you know, just starting therapy when you, I've done um, a webinar and I've written articles about professional, for professional development for therapists. And from the first meeting, shame is in the room or now maybe it's in the Zoom call. So it takes courage to overcome feeling like a failure or feeling inept in your life, or having these problems, to reach out to, for help. And then people don't usually say, unless they've read my book, and then they call me about that, but I usually do, people don't say, I need help with shame. They come to therapy because their relationship isn't working, their job isn't working, or they can't motivate themselves, depression or anxiety. Most anxiety is shame anxiety, which I write about. And that's the anticipation of experiencing shame. You're projecting in the future, I can't take this job or this promotion or give this speech or date this person because I'm going to fail or my inadequacy will be revealed and then I'll feel even worse. I will feel a lot of shame. So that would be an example of shame, anxiety. So when they contact a therapist, they might feel like they're exposing family secrets that might be shameful, disclosing that they, if they think they should be able to handle everything on their own. A lot of people have that belief. So now they've realized they've tried everything and they still can't do it themselves. And then some people shame themselves for feeling shame. They may feel shame about the imbalance of power in the relationship because a therapist is the expert. And now they're coming to somebody for help. They may have shame about not uh, feeling like they're indulging themselves to get therapy, or they can barely afford the fee. So there's a lot of aspects that are right there in the beginning. And just talking about themselves can bring up a lot of shame. And they're afraid of being judged or exposing their feelings if they start to cry. So it's all right there on the surface. And I didn't realize that before I wrote the book. And you know, with my research and experience, it helped me to just jump right in. And when it's alive in the session, that's when you can be the most effective. So what are some of the signs or symptoms that people should be looking for to know that they, maybe what's going on for them, whether they've called it shame or codependency, right? Maybe they don't have the words for it yet, but what should they be on the lookout for to know, hey, this is something I should probably seek help about? Well, depression and anxiety, for sure, is usually shame underneath. Feelings of emptiness, feeling inadequate in terms of, like, for instance, dating. Nobody ever commits to me, so I feel bad about myself. A difficulty in setting boundaries and saying no if they're being abused in any way. They may not know they're being abused, but I say to people, if you think you might be being abused, you probably are. So you don't have to be hit to be being abused. And... A lot of the things that I mentioned, like feeling insecure, feeling very dependent, being indecisive, you can't make decisions, you can't speak up, you feel in a group, you're, you don't share your opinions and things like that. And if you've had any kind of abuse 
in your childhood, for sure, or addiction. If you're involved with an addict, if you're involved with someone with a personality disorder, so those are some red flags. If you have a problem with aggression, if you're really defensive, so if you're really sensitive to criticism and, and highly defensive, that's a clue also. Or if you're always comparing yourself to others and coming up short, that's a sure way to shame yourself. I always tell people the first step, this is the first step in the 10 steps of self-esteem, is to start writing your negative self-talk. And usually people say, oh, I don't have any. And then they, they start thinking about it and they start noticing it. And all the shoulds, you're always shooting on yourself. So that's shaming yourself. So why does recovery from codependency look like? Like, how do I start this journey if I'm listening to this podcast and this is ringing true for me and I need to get some help? Where do I start? Well, you can go to Codependence Anonymous meetings. You can get a therapist. Those are good ways, good things to do. My website, whatiscodependency.com. Has a lot of information on all of the symptoms. There's about 200 blogs. In fact, the banner is a recovery roadmap. So I list this with imagery and words. I really talk about the steps of recovery and self-love is the key. But first you have to come out of denial. So get all the information you can because denial is the hallmark of addiction and codependency is an addictive process. So usually Codependents think someone else is the problem, or they contact me and say, I have this friend and she needs so much help. How can I help her? And they're consumed with helping someone else rather than themselves. And then being able to let go and detach from someone else's problems, someone else's addiction, also not reacting all over the place to whatever someone else says. That's the beginning of having some boundaries. And building that self-esteem, taking action to specific things you can do to raise your self-esteem. And then eventually look at your past and heal wounds from your childhood. And learning to be assertive, because assertiveness builds self-esteem and confidence. And our communication reveals our self-esteem. When you go on an interview, people don't talk about self-esteem, but how you communicate connotes your whether you have self-esteem or not. And the more direct you are, the more to the point you are, the less reactive you are, sure of yourself, that communicates confidence and self-esteem. And the more self-esteem you have, the more assertive you'll be. So it's a dialectical process. And I always say setting boundaries is like assertiveness graduate school. So it's hard to set boundaries if they're very important. But first, you have to learn the steps involved. First of all, you have to know what you're feeling to know if you want a boundary. So a lot of people are not, as I said, in touch with their feelings. Then you have to feel like you have a right to them. So if you were mistreated or ignored, your needs and feelings were ignored as a child, you might feel like you have certain rights. Clients are always telling me, oh, I couldn't do that. It would be selfish. I can't say no. Or my having my needs met are selfish rather than that's your responsibility to take care of yourself and your needs. And then, you know, in the end, as you are more recovered, you start taking that self-esteem out into the world. I call that self-empowerment. And you start pursuing your larger goals and passions instead of living such a close, fearful life. You have more confidence to do what you want, pursue your dreams in the world. Love that. And I, I'm just thinking about my own journey in recovery as I'm hearing you talk about that. And I was in therapy long before I ever knew my truth, you know, my full truth. And I'm sure every day I'm learning more about what that truth, that, that full truth is for myself. And I just think about how that looked to heal from those years with my mother putting on me all of that shame. And it sounds like because it was, she was feeling shame it was being put on me. And, and like I said, I know that I, for one, and I think Clarissa too can say, you know, talk about the fact that many of our clients have this, this similar relationship with one or, or both of our, of the parents and in hearing this recovery, you know, from codependency, what that can look like and how to start, you know, is there anything special or different or specific that you do with clients or that you suggest when we're specifically talking about healing from shame of having this experience with that kind of parent? Well, a few things. 
I combine different techniques. So I have psychoanalytic training. So I work about feelings that are going on between us in the room. It's called transference, you know, and and so what's happening, and that's very powerful. Clients tend to like that um, because it makes the therapy very alive. They're not talking about their girlfriend. It's like, oh, something I said just shamed them, right? And maybe I apologize and they never experienced that before. Or maybe I revealed something and that they thought, oh, well, that's, it's okay to do that. So, or maybe I had a client that I had a buzzer to press to get into my building. And I'm trying to remember the facts. For some reason, I think she was afraid to press it. Oh, no, I know. Somebody else walked in and she walked in. So she didn't press the buzzer. She just walked in when the gate opened. And then that brought up so much shame about her and indecision. Like, had, did she upset me? And, and we spent a couple of weeks actually talking about that. And it related to something in her childhood where she actually walked in on her parents uh, in bed or something and was punished for that. So that brings me to another technique I use, and that is, uh, it's called an affect bridge, where I use what's going on in the present to associate to uh, trauma memories in the past. And sometimes uh, that's enough. And and other times I help people go in and redo the past and maybe advocate for themselves or stand up to that parent. And that's followed with comforting their that inner child and building self-compassion because that's the key. Self-love is the key. So instead of shaming themselves to comfort themselves and empathize with that child, And then the other thing that is a big part of my work is cognitive behavioral therapy. In my book, Conquering Shame, there are charts, and one of them is a graph where you, if you feel triggered, you can write down what was the events, what were your thoughts, what were your feelings, what were your beliefs, uh, what were your defenses, what does it remind you of, and how you might, what would be another interpretation? Somebody didn't return my call. Well, Right away, you think they're angry at me or they don't like me, but maybe it's they didn't get the message. Maybe they're busy. There's something else that's going on to try to break through that automatic shame, that negative filter, because there's a lot of cognitive distortions that come with shame that lead to obsessions and depression, such as negative filtering, like I said, or catastrophizing things. They make one mistake and they think they're a total failure or black and white thinking. So there's just, and I have a blog called Reality Isn't What You Think. And I list a lot of these negative kind of mental processes that distort reality. So starting to be more in present time is the goal. When we heal from shame, I want to just point out that it's a normal emotion. So we're not going to get rid of shame. It can be helpful. It can curb behavior that would be not only embarrassing, but would alienate you from others. Like if you're talking on your cell phone during a um, memorial service for someone, things like that, or in the movie theater. Uh, But the kind of shame that we're talking about, where you really feel overwhelmed as a bad person, and that can linger and go on and on, that can be worked with and minimized. So you don't go down this shame spiral. I call it the well of shame. Because once you trip into that manhole, that well, you may have trouble getting, climbing your way out of it. So you want to catch it before you already fall into it because it leads to more negative thinking, more shame, more depression, more emptiness, more despair. And then it's like hard to crawl your way out of it. So when you are making progress in your recovery, you'll notice you don't overreact to criticism. You're able to hear criticism. And then maybe beyond that, you don't take it personally, that you're able to think about it. And you're able to think about your own mistakes. It's not just other people's criticism, your self-criticism. So you're kinder with yourself. If you make a mistake, you might laugh at it or get curious. I always say, well, instead of judging yourself, just be curious. Like, that's interesting. Why did I yell at that person? Why did I not share something instead of judging yourself? right away. What motivated me? And so those are signs of recovery. In my own, I had an example I'll share with you. I was very upset about something that happened in a relationship. 
And I that night I was having dinner with a girlfriend. So I was very upset about something that happened. And that night I had planned to have dinner with a girlfriend. And when we started talking, I started telling her all about the situation and how emotionally upset I was and it's going on and on. And after about 20 minutes, I guess, I don't know how long she said, Darlene, you haven't even asked about me. And in the past, I would have been mortified because, you know, my mother, my narcissistic mother would say I was like self-centered and inconsiderate and all these labels. So that would really hit home, be a tender point for me. But I was able to just shift and say, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Well, tell me what's going on with you. So I didn't disappear and get overwhelmed. That what is So you asked earlier, what is shame? And it's a profound feeling of inadequacy and alienation. The worst part is the alienation. You feel alienated from others, but even worse from the good parts of yourself. So you feel like you have nothing redeemable. And it's a feeling of, yeah, I just want to run and hide or disappear. So often you can't do that. Like I'm sitting across from a friend at dinner. I can't like run out of the room or crawl under the table. So what happens is you freeze often. Your mind, you can't think. Maybe some people can relate to this, like a child, you're being reprimanded as a child and you can't really think and you just kind of hang your head and nod. But as adults, you don't even hang your head. So maybe your face freezes. So you could see people that are traumatized they have less expression on their face. It's kind of frozen. And so they may dissociate and then they can't think clearly. Or your boss calls you in and starts you know, questioning you and you, everything you know kind of disappears. You can't really be clear, answer the question. Or you're giving a talk and suddenly you hear yourself speaking and you become aware of it. And then your whole speech goes out of your mind and you can't remember anything. So those are little instances of shame rather than saying, you know, with some recovery, you say, oh, I just lost my train of thought. Where did I come? You know, and you'll see like newscasters on TV and they're used to this and they may just own it and laugh about it or make a joke. So humor is a defense to shame and it's very effective. It's a more mature way to handle. So can you tell us what is the next project you are working on and where can our listeners find you? Thank you. Well, I'm currently writing a book called Dating, Loving, and Leading a Narcissist, and it should be out in a couple months. I have an ebook on a dealing with a narcissist, and this is much more expanded. It's also a paperback, and it includes dating and all the signs and then A lot of people want to get out of a relationship or they can't decide and it covers all of that and newer research and a lot more material and that should be out in a couple months. So that's what I'm working on. I'm on all social media. And as I said, my website is whatiscodependency.com and there are links there to my podcast and YouTube channel where I have a YouTube channel and some videos and social media. I'm on Instagram and LinkedIn and Twitter and Facebook, of course, Pinterest. So if you just put in my name on Google, you'll find a lot of my material. And you can sign up for my blog and get free 14 tips for letting go. And I send out a monthly blog, which you can receive. Oh my goodness. Putting so much goodness out into the world. I mean... (laughs) Where do you find the time and energy? It's you're inspiring. Like, I hope to be like you someday when I grow up. Just that (laughs) giving so much. I I enjoy, I really enjoy writing. And so that was one of my desires as a kid to become a writer and a shrink, actually. So I ended up not being a psychiatrist, but I ended up really being doing therapy with people and writing, combining what I was probably meant to do. And so I'm, I enjoy it. Well, you can tell, or I can tell, right. We can tell that you enjoy it, that you really, this is who you are. And so we have a signature question and typically we ask specifically about food addiction because we are a food addiction specific podcast, but I wanted to change it up a little bit because this season we're exploring more avenues when it comes to recovery and different aspects of the disease and our challenges in recovery. And so my question to you, our signature question for you is going to be, 
if you could tell a younger version of yourself something about healing and recovery from shame and or codependency, what would it be? Well, for a long time, I didn't get help. So I think that would be the main thing to not waste time and seek out therapy because it took me a long time to do that for many reasons. And that's what I would encourage. And especially if you're in an abusive relationship, that includes a relationship with, with an addict also, there's a lot of pressure to hide what's going on. It's not as so much as it used to be because of the internet. There's just so much more information. I didn't know I was being abused. I took an assertiveness class. Then I got the word. I went home and said to my husband, you're being abusive. <laughs> and he like, his jaw dropped. So the hiding of it is makes it all worse. And the more you are in a relationship that's abusive or you're not getting your needs met, the worse your codependency is. I have on my blog and in my book, Codependency for Dummies, charts on the progression of addiction and codependency. And it goes from the beginning to the middle stage and then the later stages. So just like anything, if you injure yourself, they always say, you know, get treatment right away. Because the longer your body compensates for that injury, then your spine is out of alignment. Or then, you know, other muscles take over for that injury. And and then it's harder. You can still heal, but it's a longer process. It's more painful. It's harder. So get help right away. That's what I would say. And there's no, unfortunately, as I said, some people resist getting help because they feel ashamed of it. And I know that people with eating disorders, they have shame about that or shame about alcoholism or some addiction. And so they don't want to reveal it, but that's the problem. Or even to get antidepressant medication if necessary or psychotropic, they're ashamed of that. They don't want to be dependent. And then they they suffer and they get worse and worse. That's a great message. Because if you injure yourself, get help, right? So get help. If you're in pain, get help. If you're struggling, get help and don't wait. Yeah. You don't have to do it alone. That's a myth. That's part of shame too. It's like, if you didn't get help and comfort and mirroring from a parent at an early age, you develop the, this is another symptom. You get the message and the compensation. I guess I have to rely on myself because I can't rely on my parent. So that sets it up that you have to be self-sufficient, which has a whole string of consequences in itself, inhibiting uh, intimacy and impairing relationships, but also from getting help, especially for emotional needs. So in my book, Conquering Shame and Codependency, I use some examples of eating people with eating disorders who have feelings of emptiness and they keep filling it with food, but it's not the physical food. It's the disconnection, the self-alienation that comes from shame. And then what they do is they overeat and then they feel shame about their weight and the overeating and maybe they want to purge. And there's this negative cycle rather than, you know, getting help for what the cause is and feeling that emptiness is, it's just disconnect. It's healing. Their emptiness is about reconnecting to themselves and loving themselves. That's the missing link and codependency and shame makes us look outside ourselves. So the gap between our real self becomes greater and greater. And it's never gets, it's like the more I eat or the more I drink or the more I want approval from somebody, my emptiness gets deeper and deeper because I can never get it from the outside. It'll never fill me up. And that's what they talk about narcissistic supply that you, whatever you give to a narcissist, you know, five minutes later, they want more because there's so much emptiness inside. Well, it applies to a lesser degree to codependence. There's a lot of similarity there. They happen to think that narcissists are codependent. So it's that vicious cycle. So you have to stop doing what you're doing. I wrote an article on emptiness and it's a shorter version is in my book on shame because that's underneath it all is this emptiness. Well, thank you so much for being here today, Darlene, and shining a light on shame and codependency and how we can heal from that. Thank you so much for inviting me. And I appreciate your the interest of your listeners and I hope they benefit from my sharing. Oh, I think they really will. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. You're welcome. Bye-bye. 
Thanks for joining us this week on Food Junkies, Recovery from Food Addiction. Make sure to join our Facebook group, Sugar Free for Life Support Group, I'm Sweet Enough. You can subscribe to our show in iTunes or Stitchers. That way you'll never miss an episode. While you're at it, if you found value in this show, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us out too. Don't forget to pick up your copy of Dr. Tarman's book, Food Junkies, which is available on Amazon. If you have any additional questions, both Molly and Clarissa are food addiction professionals and work one-on-one with clients. You can find their websites and email addresses in the show notes. Be sure to tune in every Friday when our new episodes drop. As Vera loves to say, the power is ours. <laughs>